Uh, the title of today's uh, lecture is The Arab Spring, Israel and the United States. And yes, it's true, as a lot of people have mentioned, calling what's happening today in the Arab world the Arab Spring is um, it's simply uh, ridiculous. I, I mean, it's, it's clearly not an Arab Spring, except for um, the radical Islamists who are taking over uh, the Arab world as we speak. And I think that it's important to uh, really uh, step back for a second and think about what has happened. Last year, on, uh, uh, on January 25th, uh, we saw the popular uprising, or uh, the somewhat popular uprising against uh, uh, long-time, uh, three-decade president of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, in Tahrir Square. The month before, we saw the beginning of the uprising against the uh, long-time president of Tunisia, and so on and so forth. And uh, what we see is that the countries where the regimes are being overthrown are countries where the regimes that are being overthrown or have been overthrown are pro-Western or neutral towards uh, the East and the West. So for instance, Mubarak was the United States' principal ally in the Arab world. Uh, Bin Ali in Tunisia was essentially in the Western column. Muammar Gaddafi from Libya had been neutered essentially since 2004 and posed no threat any longer to Western interests. Um, in Bahrain, the uh, Sunni minority government that had been ruling the area for decades uh, was clearly on the uh, Western side of the uh, ledger with the U.S. Fifth Fleet docked in Bahrain's harbor, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a weakening of the pro-Western regimes that are still maintaining power in Morocco, where the Muslim Brotherhood uh, just won the majority in their parliamentary elections in Jordan, where King Abdallah has given more power to the parliament to run the country, and the parliament is run by the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and so on and so forth. You have an effective civil war in Syria, where you have the anti-American uh, Ba'athist regime, the Iranian puppet, essentially, uh, uh, Bashar Assad, is fighting a civil war, more or less, or what is becoming a civil war, against an opposition supported by Turkey and dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood. So what we see is that, and in uh, Yemen as well, we saw the overthrow of the president and the opposition that is coming to power. Uh, it has a very large uh, component of al-Qaeda uh, inside of it. <clears throat> so again, uh, in all the places where we're seeing this unrest unfold, which is essentially everywhere, uh, we see that the most popular forces are the populist forces, and the populist forces in the Arab world are the forces of radical Islam, uh, from Al-Qaeda in Yemen and in Libya, uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists in Egypt, who, according to the official results that were just released today, uh, together have 79% of the seats in the Egyptian parliament. Um, and then uh, they're aligned not only with Al-Qaeda, which is spawned from the Muslim Brotherhood and of course the Salafists, but also with Hamas, which is also spawned from uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, and so on and so forth. So the question is, first of all, so this is what's happening in the Arab world. The question is, how does this impact each Israel, first and foremost? How does this impact us? And I would say that on, uh, in the balance, it, it doesn't affect us as much as we would think that it would doesn't affect us as much as we think that it would, would, that it would because it's essentially a lateral change inside of the Arab world. The regimes that have been toppled were not pro-Israel. They were pro-Western, but they weren't pro-Israel. Um, Mubarak was essentially waging a cold war against Israel for 30 years of his presidency in the sense that he was, uh, his regime was the leading force behind the uh, political war against Israel in the international arena. Um, they were training for war against Israel. The Muslim uh, Brotherhood was very, very influential inside of the Egyptian military from the time of uh, Nasser through Sadat and on to uh, Mubarak. So it, it wasn't as though Mubarak was a great friend of Israel. On the other hand, for his own interest, for his own reasons of regime survival, he did clamp down on uh, Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood <coughs> elements inside of Egypt, and that made him as well uh, very 
uh, opposed to Hamas, which is the Muslim Brotherhood in, in uh, Palestinian society. And as a result, he did take some uh, marginal steps to block, not even marginal, some significant steps to block the empowerment of Hamas uh, in Gaza that uh, were uh, important for Israel. On the other hand, because we saw him as an ally, which he wasn't, uh, most of the leadership in Israel over the past three decades since the signing of the peace with Egypt were blind to the threats that emanated from Egypt, that emanated, for instance, from the Egyptian Navy, which is more powerful uh, in many respects than the Israeli Navy, uh, were blind to the strategic repercussions of the fact that for years the Egyptian military has been fighting war games uh, against a theoretical enemy, which happens to be a country located to the north of Egypt, which of course is Israel. Um, and we have been blind to the strategic implications of the uh, anti-Semitic incitement and the anti-Semitism that is pervasive, in fact all pervasive, throughout Egyptian society for the long-term stability of the peace. So, Whereas under Mubarak, we weren't paying attention to the threat posed by Egypt to Israel. Today, we are much more uh, aware of it, much more open about discussing it, and also preparing for uh, the likelihood of the breakdown of the peace between Israel and Egypt and the transformation of Egypt from a country that has not been participating actively uh, in warfare against Israel since 1979, 77, depending on how you count, to a country that will be very much involved in uh, warfare against Israel, most likely uh, through the support of terrorism, terrorist attacks against Israel, transfer of advanced weaponry to Gaza, and so on and so forth, like we've already seen with the cross-border attack uh, from Sinai in August and the attack on our embassy uh, in the fall. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, the threat that now is posed by Egypt is something that is larger than it was uh, under Mubarak, but on the other hand, the salutary uh, development from Israel's perspective is that at least we're aware of it now and we're taking uh, the kind of steps necessary to protect ourselves from it, at least uh, beginning to take the steps necessary to protect ourselves from the burgeoning threat uh, posed by the post-Mubarak, uh, the uh, radical Islamic Egypt that will be ruled by the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, essentially Al-Qaeda, that's what the uh, Salafists are. So uh, on balance, it's marginally worse for Israel, but not, not majorly worse for Israel. It's not something that has to alarm us. And the other reason we, we don't have to be hysterical over what's happening in Egypt is because they are essentially bankrupt um, within the next couple of months, they're going to have massive starvation in Egypt, and this, of course, is a horrible thing from a humanitarian perspective, but it makes it very unlikely that they're going to have the wherewithal uh, to go to war against Israel uh, because they're going to be so bankrupt. The same could be said <coughs> for Syria, which is also um, now in no economic shape to uh, make war against Israel. And as to Syria, I would say that whereas with Egypt, uh, the situation for Israel is marginally worse, the situation for us with uh, what's happening in Syria is marginally better than it was before the beginning of the civil unrest, the civil war, or whatever ends up shaping up in Syria. Um, first of all, we have to understand that whereas Mubarak was marginally supportive of Israel because he had shared interest with Israel in terms of fighting the Muslim Brotherhood and fighting the Salafists and fighting Hamas. Um, Syria, of course, is an enemy of Israel. It's an effective colony of Iran. It's a major supporter of all terrorist uh, organizations that are warring against Israel. First and foremost, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, but also Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Pakistan Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and so on and so forth. So, um, if Assad falls, uh, those organizations are going to be harmed, and we already see this in terms of the unease that has uh, really uh, taken over Hamas's external leadership, Khalid Masha, uh, Musa Abu Marzouk, and the rest of them are all looking for new places to live because 
Assad is essentially fighting them, is fighting Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, and so they're being placed in an untenable situation uh, in terms of remaining there, in terms of remaining loyal to the Syrian regime. So um, that's good. And uh, if uh, he falls, then Hezbollah will lose much of its uh, logistical base, which is now located in Syria, and they'll be weakened in Lebanon because they won't have their state patron next door in, you know, in the form of uh, Bashar Assad. Um, and so uh, that's good. Uh, he'll probably, the Alawites, the uh, sect that he represents, um, are very aligned with Shiite Islam, and the likely successor regime uh, will be dominated by Sunni Muslims. And so, again, um, that's going to be harmful to Hezbollah. Um, on the other hand, we have different problems, one of which is uh, serious weapons of mass destruction. Um, there's nothing like a dictator in terms of being able to trust him to uh, maintain control over his weapons of mass destruction. So is the case in Libya, and now we don't know exactly where Gaddafi's chemical weapons are, and his, uh, his, uh, um, his anti-aircraft uh, missiles and other advanced uh, weapons of terror essentially have gone missing, and uh, according to the IDF, a lot of them have made their way to Gaza uh, through post Mubarak uh, Egypt. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen. Syria is a major proliferator of weapons of mass destruction, not only the nuclear proliferation that they were engaging in when uh, the IDF uh, reportedly uh, destroyed their nuclear reactor that was built by North Korea and uh, paid for by Iran in September of 2007, but also they have a very large arsenal of biological and chemical weapons and a huge arsenal of Scud missiles and other ballistic missiles that are capable of reaching every spot in Israel. So that, as the army said last week, is a major concern for Israel. We don't know what's going to happen to their weapons of mass destruction arsenal in the event of the collapse of the regime, the implosion of the regime, the overthrow of the regime, whatever ends up happening. So that is a very uh, dangerous situation and the likelihood that they could end up in the hands of people like Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, is something that can't be uh, can't be overlooked or minimized in terms of the danger. On the other hand, because Bashar Assad is so busy at home trying to deal uh, with his own home and staying in power, he has much less time right now to devote to doing things against Israel. And so we saw, for instance, before all of this happened last May, uh, he was able to organize uh, the Palestinians and the refugee camps in Syria to march on the Israeli border, and we had that whole uh, very disturbing uh, situation unfold in Majd al-Shams in the northern Golan Heights, where you had thousands of Palestinians uh, trying to uh, climb over the fence and into Israel, and some of them actually succeeded. One of them, I understand, got as far as Tel Aviv, and, um, and so that was very disturbing. Um, I, I saw a news report saying that that may happen again. I personally find it difficult to imagine that that's going to happen because the Palestinians themselves are taking sides and a lot of the camps inside of Syria are siding with the opposition against Assad. So you have a very um, complicated situation in Syria, but I think that on balance you could say that it marginally improves Israel's strategic situation vis-a-vis -vis Syria. Um, the, the other threat emanating from Syria is that if to the extent that a successor regime based upon the current opposition that is now really considered to be the, the most influential opposition <coughs> uh, faction actually does take over the country, that is a faction that is controlled essentially by the Turks and the Turks under Erdogan and his Islamist regime are emerging very swiftly as a true enemy of Israel, uh, and a very, very powerful one of that with their membership in NATO and their, uh, and their close relationship with uh, Washington. <coughs> so uh, that successor regime, to the extent that it's able in the medium and long term to, uh, to take over in, a, in an effective manner in Syria, could end up posing a threat to us that is no smaller than the threat posed to us today by Assad. 
So I would say things are at the margins probably better for us in the short term. It's hard to know. And look, we had no idea this was going to happen a year ago. It certainly would be unwise to uh, wager how it's going to be in the medium or long term. But it's a mixed situation. In Lebanon, again, uh, we're marginally better off because Hezbollah is being weakened by what's happening in Syria. Uh, Jordan, they're being stressed. The Hashemites in Jordan are being stressed from the north by Syria, from the east by Iraq, post-U.S. withdrawal, where you see Iran essentially doing exactly what uh, King Abdullah warned it would do in 2004, which is taking over Iraq. Um, and so they're being stressed very badly from there. And, um, and, and also from within, with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, demanding and essentially uh, being granted a lot of additional powers in terms of what the direction of Jordan is going to be in the, next, uh, in the coming years. So you see that what Abdallah is doing, and what we saw this past week with his visit to Washington, is that he's trying to push the West further away from Israel, uh, and uh, putting more pressure on Israel in an attempt to, um, to, to win the favor of the Palestinians inside of Jordan to be perceived as the champion of the Palestinian cause against Israel, as one of the leaders of the political war against Israel. Um, I don't think that he has a stronger case to sell to the Palestinians than the Muslim Brotherhood does, or than Hamas does, and as a consequence, I think that even his attempts to turn against Israel and to wage a very vociferous political war against Israel in Washington it, are not going to leave his regime in a better position than it is in currently because the forces that are rising in Jordan are all inimical to the Hashemites and to the survivability of that regime. So I would say that the chances of survival for the Hashemites are small. And you know, some people say when, when they're overthrown, we can make the case that Jordan is Palestine. Yeah, there's some truth to that, but it's also true that the people who are going to be running Jordan are likely not going to be uh, interested in doing anything other than uh, making life very difficult for Israel indeed. So uh, I think that that's very, uh, very much the way that things are going. And again, I think that it's important to recognize that the situation was not great for Israel to begin with. We were never in, a, in an alliance with any of our neighbors, with the Arab world, and therefore the changes that are taking place in the Arab world uh, don't really change the situation uh, that Israel has in the Middle East uh, in, in a very profound way. Um, and that's important to, uh, to mention and to, and to emphasize. Now, how has Israel dealt with uh, the uh, revolutionary movements throughout the Arab world? I would say that, on balance, we've uh, dealt with it pretty much as well as we possibly can. Uh, Israel has responded with caution and with uh, pessimism to events in the Muslim world. In the Arab world, uh, Israel has been warning uh, the West, and particularly the United States, to understand that forces that win elections are not necessarily amenable to Western interests and are not necessarily peaceful, and, um, and, and that's correct. Uh, to the extent that Israel's made some mistakes, I would say um, a mistake that perhaps on, on uh, first glance doesn't look like it has strategic implications, but actually does is the uh, social war that's going on right now, the cultural war that's being waged by certain forces inside of Israeli society with more, with greater or lesser support, the political uh, spectrum inside of Israel against the national religious, uh, the national religious uh, sector in Israel is also the Haredi sector in Israel about uh, military service. And I think it's important to understand that, particularly due to uh, the, the transformation of Egypt under the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists, and particularly in the immediate term, what's happening inside of the Sinai, um, it is very important to increase the size of the IDF in a significant way in terms of manpower, in terms of combat manpower. Um, I would just throw out that uh, we need at least another division in the Southern Command. Uh, to deal with the rising threats, we're going to have to also uh, increase the size of our military budget 
Um, we already saw a fight about that last week when, in fact, Prime Minister Netanyahu did increase the size of the military budget. But I think it's going to have to be increased substantially because we're going to have to buy the platforms that we're going to need in order to train for desert warfare for the first time since the 1970s. Um, and we also have to prepare a whole doctrine for dealing with the Sinai now that it's essentially controlled by Al-Qaeda. So I think that to the extent that uh, developments inside of Israeli domestic politics lower the motivation of uh, various sectors inside of Israeli society um, to serve in the army, I think that there are strategic implications for those kinds of of battles and that we have to recognize uh, that this is not a time to be demoralizing important sectors of society, but rather doing everything that we can to ensure that as many uh, young men uh, who are combat able are serving in the army. Um, on the other hand, uh, yeah, I think it's important to us to recognize that there is some benefit to what's happening uh, from a political perspective from Israel internationally, which is that I think, you know, until last year, there was this crazy argument going around uh, the world that uh, nothing is going to change in the Arab world uh, until Israel coughs up the West Bank of the Jordan River and Jordan because a billion Muslims and 300 million Arabs, all they care about is the establishment of a Palestinian state. That's all that motivates them to act. What they really care about is where Jews are living and whether there are Jews living in Samaria and mobile homes or not. And that's really, you know, what, what uh, winds their clock. Nothing else matters to them. And I think that in, in the aftermath of the events of the last year and looking ahead to what's likely your or doubtless going to be tra uh, transpiring in the next year or two. Um, nobody can any long, nobody can make that argument uh, with a straight face any longer, or, or receive credibility for those kinds of arguments because it's so obviously been overtaken by events. So I think that to uh, that degree, it's important. And the question is, what what else can Israel do? Is there anything that Israel can do to change the situation for the better? Uh, regionally, and I think, first of all, vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world, it's really precious little that we can do. I mean, we don't have we don't have uh, leverage over the regimes in Egypt or anywhere else, uh, to a limited degree, perhaps in Jordan, but very limited, uh, especially given the massive strains that are being placed on King Abdullah today. Um, I think that the one thing that we could probably do that. Uh, on, on surfaces unre unrelated to what's happening to the Arab world, uh, but in fact is related to it, and is uh, bomb Iran's nuclear installations. Because if, we, if we're able to successfully uh, neutralize Iran's uh, nuclear program, we would um, be uh, empowering the Green Movement, which is the one populist movement, anti-regime populist movement in the Muslim world today, which is actually anti-Islamist. So uh, to the extent that we would be weakening the regime in Tehran by destroying its nuclear installations, or at least uh, setting back its nuclear program in a, in a, in a significant manner, uh, we would be empowering a, a movement inside of an Islamic country that has a lot of power over what's happening in the Muslim world, in the Arab world, particularly in Iraq and in Lebanon and Syria, uh, in a very salutary way uh, for Israel's national interest. So that not only would we uh, remove or at least delay a very, the most uh, pressing threat to Israel's national security in the form of the Iranian uh, nuclear weapons program, but we would actually have the potential of, of uh, bringing about or facilitating the overthrow of one of the most dangerous regimes in the, in, in the region for us uh, and replacing it with one that at a minimum would not be as hostile as the current one is. So that is Israel. Uh, and now the third leg of the triangle of uh, this evening's lecture is uh, the United States. So I think it's important to recognize that whereas uh, Israel's fortunes, Israel's uh, strategic posture, Israel's national interests have been hurt at the margins 
uh, but not in a fundamental manner by the events uh, in the Arab world since uh, last uh, December. Uh, the United States' national interests have been hurt in a fundamental way uh, by what's happened in the Arab world. Um, they have uh, taken several direct hits to their interests, and uh, they are in a much weaker position in the Middle East today than they were on the eve of the revolutionary fervor uh, in the Arab world. And this is important to realize because the regimes that had fallen by the wayside, been overthrown, were in fact American allies. Not Israeli allies, but they were American allies and they're gone and they're being replaced by forces that are anti-American. Now, there's also, unlike Israel, the United States is in a position to um, do certain things that can actually have a positive impact on the regional situation. Uh, first of all, in terms of Egypt, the United States can tip the scales in favor of the Egyptian military, which, warts and all, is certainly better than uh, Al-Qaeda. Um, and the Americans can do that through, first and foremost, their economic assistance and their potential to provide future economic assistance and military assistance to Egypt by saying that if the balance in power between the military and the Muslim Brotherhood slash uh, Salafists is not to Washington's liking that they will cut off aid. Right now, the Americans have been um, making their conditions for continuing aid on the continuation of the Egyptian peace treaty with Israel, which I think is um, very silly because under the rubric of maintaining their peace with Israel, Egypt can essentially do anything it wants. It can abrogate the peace for Israel, but never sit down and, or stand in front of television cameras and tear up the peace with Israel and say, we're formally at peace with Israel while they are essentially waging war against Israel. So to uh, tie uh, con a, to tie your leverage to something that is essentially meaningless from a strategic perspective, um, and has only uh, meaning in a propaganda war, which in and of itself uh, is, is um, overstepped or, or outweighed with the domestic propaganda inside of Egypt. And we'll just see them saying, just as they always have inside of their own country to their own people, jihad, 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 let's destroy the Jews. And then to Washington, just like Yasser Arafat did, say, well, no, we don't have any problem with the continued peace process with Israel or peace treaty with Israel, which is what we're seeing them do already. So if Washington were to tie the maintenance of their aid package to Egypt to having the balance of power be in favor of the military, that would uh, uh, mitigate uh, to some extent the empowerment of the uh, forces of radical Islam. As far as Syria is concerned, the United States has been following Turkey's lead uh, and the current opposition movement that is now the dominant movement inside of uh, Syria, which is dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood, is not the only opposition group in Syria. There is, for instance, another one that is uh, dominated by the Kurds, who are pro-Western, who are pro-Israel, who are pro-American, and uh, the United States could certainly change its allegiance and support from one opposition movement to another at this time, and that would have a, a significant impact on, on uh, the future of Syria. It can weaken Hezbollah in Lebanon by uh, making American continued aid to Lebanon contingent on the end of Hezbollah control over the Lebanese government. And with Hezbollah currently in a weakened position due to Bashar Assad's uh, civil war, uh, that would be something that may actually have the potential of, uh, of uh, having an impact in terms of Hezbollah's continued control over the Lebanese government. They could also weaken Hezbollah by actually taking action against Hezbollah in Latin America, something that they haven't done, and so on and so forth. In Iraq, uh, the United States certainly has massive uh, leverage over the Iraqi government still. They're not using it, but uh, they could. Uh, quite simply tell Maliki that they were not going to uh, provide him with any further arms or economic aid if he doesn't uh, stop moving towards uh, 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 vesting himself with dictatorial powers and renewing the civil war 
or the internecine war between uh, the Shiites and the Sunnis, with the Shiites being directly supported by the Iranian government and the Sunnis in the absence of the Americans being supported by no one other than Al-Qaeda. So, I mean, the United States could do a lot there, and if they were to do something in Iraq, then that would also have an impact on what's happening in Jordan. Uh, and of course, the United States could attack Iran's nuclear installations. That might have an impact, too. Uh, <coughs> unfortunately, so far, everything that the United States has done since last December, and even going back further over the past three years, has been inimical to its own interests and has served to empower its worst enemies against its best allies. Um, and uh, it, the, the most amazing thing is that it's not clear how the situation would look today if the United States hadn't played such a central role in harming itself. Prominent, you know, I think a couple of uh, points will simply illustrate this larger point. And the United States, we, we obviously, as Israelis, we look at the way that the United States under Obama has mistreated Israel and the way that it has really tried to mitigate uh, or, or temp down the alliance between Israel and the United States in so many different ways since he's taken office. But uh, just think about the way that the United States pro prominently intervened in Egypt and in Libya. So first, Egypt. American intervention on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood actually began not uh, last December or last January when the uprising against Mubarak began, but rather uh, can be uh, traced to, uh, at the latest, June of 2009, when uh, President Obama went to Cairo and spoke at Al-Azhar University, which is the stronghold of the Brotherhood. Uh, and essentially uh, embrace their whole view of uh, the existence of a pan-Islamic movement, of a pan-Islamic people, of an Islamic people. In fact, the title of his speech was an address to the Muslim world, which in and of itself inherently rejects the notion of Arab nationalism, which is at the heart of the Mubarak regime. And it was a speech that was well attended, uh, prominently attended by leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, that was not attended by Hosni Mubarak, who did not meet uh, Obama uh, at the airport, did not see him during that trip. It was a trip that was a direct hit at the legitimacy of Mubarak and uh, uh, was uh, extremely important in terms of giving international legitimacy to the Muslim Brotherhood. And then, of course, we saw uh, last January and February that uh, Obama did essentially everything that he could other than coming in himself and pulling Mubarak out of the presidential palace to overthrow the regime, uh, to the point where um, you know, Mubarak had made a deal with Frank Wisner, who was Hillary Clinton's envoy to Cairo to try to figure out how to deal with the mess. And he had made a deal with Wisner saying that he would leave office in September in an orderly fashion and have uh, general elections at that time for the parliament. And Obama rejected in prime time, in front of the cameras, what uh, the agreement that uh, Wisner and Mubarak had come up with, and essentially said Mubarak has to leave, or didn't essentially say, he said Mubarak has to leave immediately. Uh, and so uh, was uh, played a primary role in transferring uh, the seat of authority from a US ally to a US enemy in the form of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, in Egypt, I mean in Libya, the United States went to war to overthrow Gaddafi. And then uh, throughout the uh, bombing uh, campaign, which was conducted, not that we should care, but that was conducted in breach of the US Constitution and the War Powers Act, um, uh, he and his administration stubbornly refused to acknowledge the predominance of Al-Qaeda forces inside of the NATO-supported uh, opposition to uh, Gaddafi and also made light of the fact that shortly after Gaddafi fell, there was an Al-Qaeda flag raised in, Bel in Benghazi. Uh, this is quite amazing uh, that this is what happened. In, in Bahrain, uh, the United States tilted the scales against the US allied Sunni uh, regime in favor of a power sharing agreement with the Shiites who are at a minimum massively influenced by Tehran, Turkey, uh, with its anti-American, anti-Western, Islamic 
anti-democratic uh, Islamist uh, regime, anti-Semitic Islamic regime uh, that is uh, imprisoning uh, the general staff for the past 30 years of the Turkish army, with the Turkish army having been the linchpin of Turkey's membership in the Western Alliance, and the imprisonment of, of uh, journalists, and the sexual ending of Turkey's uh, continued uh, existence as a democracy such as we know it, or liberal democracy. Uh, President Obama has embraced pre uh, the, the Prime Minister of Turkey, Recep Erdogan, as his closest and most important uh, ally uh, in the Middle East. Uh, according to the press, uh, Erdogan is the leader in the region who Obama speaks to most regularly, and the one whose advice Obama seeks uh, uh, most uh, uh, most intensively. So uh, this is the this is the regime that and the government and the man that Obama has chosen to see as his most important ally in the Middle East. On the other hand, uh, when we compare and contrast the Americans' prominent intervention against Mubarak, against Gaddafi, against the Bahraini Sultan, or whatever they have there. Emir, uh, he has prominently failed to intervene in Syria uh, against the wishes of the U.S. Congress. In fact, he has maintained the embassy open. Uh, he insisted on sending an ambassador to Turkey, I mean to Syria, uh, would not remove him now. They're thinking about removing him. Um, and uh, continued to court the Syrian regime until only recently, and that has all been at the behest of Erdogan, and again, the opposition movement that the United States is supporting in Syria against Assad is dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood and controlled by Ankara. And of course, we can't forget the fact that the Obama administration and Obama personally refused to support the Green Movement against the Ayatollahs uh, in Iran in uh, June of 2009 and did not stand by them even after the regime uh, started massively, and again, in front of the television cameras, murdering, beating, torturing people who were calling for uh, the overthrow of the uh, jihadist regime in Tehran and, uh, and the embrace of the United States and even of Israel. So um, I would say that if the United States wanted to make um, contribution to stability in the in the Arab world, and not only to stability but to stability under pro-Western regimes. The first thing that they should do is take back everything that they've done until now. <laughs> because the problem is, yeah, the problem is, is that you know, he, he, the Obama administration has destroyed American credibility. He absolutely destroyed it. He has made clear to the regimes in the region, including the Saudis, who are now essentially ditching their alliance with the United States and forming a strategic alliance with the Chinese. Uh, he made clear that um, if you uh, are confrontational towards the United States, the United States will support you, and if you display weakness to the United States, that is, if you display an interest in having close relations with the United States, uh, the United States will betray you. And again, you know, we can just add to the list of governments that have been betrayed by the United States, Israel, very easily, and we see then that uh, we uh, don't have to necessarily take this personally. He does this to all U.S. allies. <laughs> you know, um, I, Obama has come under a lot of sort of crazy fringe uh, criticism since he took office. And one of the enduring themes of this is that people say that he is an undercover Muslim. And um, I actually totally, dis I, I disagree with that. I don't believe it. Uh, 
I think that uh, you know his, his children seem to be being raised Christians, his wife seems to be a Christian, and, and I don't see any reason not to believe him when he says that he is one, but I think that it's important to notice that it really doesn't matter, because say he was a Muslim, I don't think that he would be doing anything any differently than, than he's doing now. And so I think that the whole issue is a non-issue. I think what's important to notice is what he's doing is that under Obama, the United States is actively supporting Islamic movements that wish to destroy the United States. And uh, that includes, uh, by the way, the Taliban, who the United States is now conducting negotiations with, with the assumption that when NATO forces are removed from Afghanistan, next year sometime, according to the schedules, that the Taliban will reassert control over Afghanistan after so many years, uh, after 12 years, essentially, of, of American uh, military involvement in that country, whose aim was to uh, prevent that from happening. So, you know, you see with the uh, Iranian, essentially, takeover of Iraq, uh, immediately after the Americans left, as many people had warned would occur, uh, you see too that if the United States leaves, uh, the footprint that it will leave will essentially be uh, the modern day version of footprints in the desert, that they will come and go and soon be forgotten as uh, American enemies uh, retake control over Afghanistan. So again, just to go back uh, to where I began, in terms of what are we looking at with the Arab Spring, so-called the revolutions that have uh, taken over the Arab world since last December, I think we see a situation where the populist forces in the Arab world are, as many of us have warned for many years, Muslim Brotherhood and uh, radical Islamic forces that show that the worst terrorist organizations that we've had operating from uh, within the Arab world uh, against the West for the past two generations have really been very popular inside of the countries from which they have stemmed. And they are now under democracy in the Arab world taking over. Um, and again, as far as Israel is concerned, um, because everybody hates them, because anti-Semitism is so pervasive throughout the Arab world, the difference between our status in the region uh, today and under the Islamic Arab world, as opposed to the pan-nationalist, pan-Arab uh, Muslim world or Arab world uh, that we've seen uh, since the 1950s, is changed only at the margins. The biggest, uh, the biggest loser in all of this has been the United States. And preposterously, absurdly, so much of that has been as a result of America's own policies in the regions that have been undertaken by the Obama administration. So um, those are my thoughts. Again, not so terrible for us, horrible for our allies in the United States, and bad for all of the women and the non-Islamic minorities in the Muslim world. Uh, who are going to be living under a regime of terror for the foreseeable future as a result of what's happened. So those are my thoughts, and I'll be happy to take a few questions. Caroline, somebody once said, stress is the greatest, reality is the greatest single source of stress in the world. You've given us a dose of reality, but you've also put it into proper perspective for us. We'll take some questions. Back there, Mr. The gentleman. Wait until you get the microphone. And please, no speeches.
history has shown that we will the parties use anti-Semitism and the digital sentiments that seem already on the flag effects and just to divert attention and away from the home. So in the case of Cairo right now, it is like one's brotherhood in order to become the ruling party and the next party in Egypt will use its influence and anti-Semitism sentiments to spark hostilities with Israel um, to maintain legitimacy. In that case, what do you think the U.S. will do in response and what Israel has had in the past um, responded with the use of force, not just the response to terrorism, but in a likely scenario of war? Okay, so the basic question was, you know, we've seen all of these regimes using anti-Semitism to give themselves legitimacy uh, internally under Mubarak, under Abdullah, under Abu Mazen, under everybody does that. Um, so can we expect that the Muslim Brotherhood and, all, and the Salafists in Egypt may actually decide that they want to go to war against Israel in order to maintain their legitimacy inside of Egypt? And if so, how can we expect the United States to respond and how, how should Israel respond? So, um, you know, I, I think that it's important to recognize, first of all, um, that they don't really, they have street cred in a way that Mubarak uh, does not, did not, because they are the genuine article. They are Islamo-fascists, they are jihadists, and they mean it, and they're going to start instituting, you know, a massive persecution of the cops and of women, uh, they already are in Egypt, so they don't have to prove themselves to the extent that um, secular dictatorships have to prove themselves to uh, people who are uh, who are imbued with these kinds of of, of belief systems. Um, having said that, you know what are they going to do when the economy starts failing? Are they going to attack Israel in order to deflect uh, people's attention away from the fact that they're starving to death? Um, you know, I think again at the margins, I think we're already seeing, I think we're going to have more of what we've seen in Sinai in terms of cross-border attacks on Israel. Right now we've seen it uh, in miniature with one cross-border attack against the Highway 2 a lot uh, in the summertime. And with the, I think we're up to 10 now bombings of the gas pipeline to Israel. And I think that we can probably see more of that. I think that it's very difficult for me anyway uh, to foresee them transferring forces in any significant number to the Sinai and uh, opening up a con conventional war with us because they don't have the money. And uh, so they, they can't afford a war like that. Um, I don't see them getting the financial backing necessary to wage a war like that from the Saudis. Obviously, the Americans would cut them off. Uh, if they were to do so. So I, I don't see in, in the foreseeable future uh, the opening of a conventional front against Egypt. I think that you will see again, uh, you will see uh, uh, very uh, high escalation terror attacks against Israel. I think you'll see uh, more strategic collusion with Hamas and Gaza. Uh, but I don't see a war. And as for what the United States is going to do, look, you know, I mean, uh, so far, they've been uh, doing all the wrong things, um, and uh, you know, it, it, in a way, it depends on who's going to be in the White House in January 2013. Because I don't think that Obama's going to be doing anything particularly different from what he's been doing so far. Meaning that I don't think that he's going to be more hostile towards Israel and more uh, uh, forthcoming towards the Muslim Brotherhood that he's been on the eve of the elections where he's going to be tested. But if he wins re-election, um, anything goes. Go ahead. Of, of government in the United States in the future. 
Well, first, I think that it's really important to recognize that uh, the United States, the American people, in their wisdom, elected Obama uh, to the presidency. And the reason why I think it's very important to recognize that is that it can happen again. And not just this time, but that, I mean, we have an anti-Israel president in Washington. And, you know, until now, it never seemed, we always trusted that America would be there for us. And um, he, regardless of who wins, I think that the, that the uh, election couldn't be more critical from an international perspective, and not just for Israel, but for the free world. Um, but again, I think that it's important not to just say, okay, well, everything is going to be solved if Obama is, uh, is, is defeated in November. Because the fact that he could be elected in the first place tells us that we have to change the way that we are looking at our system of alliances in the world and that we can't be wholly reliant on our alliance with the United States because we don't know what's going to happen there tomorrow. Now, as, as, to, as to our, um, what, what may happen if uh, a Republican wins election in November, First of all, I think it would be very important to simply stop uh, exacerbating the damage that has been done by Obama. Again, reversing course in terms of ending the American policy of being bad to its allies and good to its enemies uh, would have a very important impact on events, not only uh, in the Middle East, but in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia, uh, uh, that, uh, that can't be uh, minimized. Uh, how easy it's going to be to turn back the wheel uh, is unclear. It depends on what happens in the Congress, and it depends on a lot of other things as well. What happens uh, in the United, how the United States views foreign affairs in the coming election, what sort of mandate uh, the next president uh, asks for in the course of the elections and, and uh, runs on as a Republican platform. I mean, there are a lot of things that are involved, but I think that if a Republican comes in at the minimum, uh, he'll probably uh, seek to at least stop the disastrous policies that Obama has instituted. And again, that would put us in a better place. But I think that something very important happened with the election of Obama. And I think that we should pay attention to what that means, not only for Israel, but for uh, the rest of uh, America's allies in the region and uh, throughout the world. Please, please wait for the mic. Thank you very much for your... Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for your evaluation of the Muslim threat to Islam. Perhaps you would like to share with us some thoughts on the effectiveness of Islam's public relations in regard to this threat. He asked, what do I think about uh, the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of Israel's uh, PR efforts in relation to what's happening in the Muslim world, or just in general? To the West. Uh, Israel's Hezbollah in terms of what we can do with the West, because I think that I addressed the issue of Hezbollah in relation to what's happening in the, in the Muslim world uh, in the course of my speech, which is a we've been doing pretty well, actually, in that arena. In terms of what, you know, our, our Hasbara policy is, um, it's a reflection of our government policy. I think that to a certain degree, the government hasn't come to a conclusion. No government, well, the left has, but the, the right wing, such as it is in, in Israeli politics, has not uh, made a decision about what it wants to do, what it wants to be when it grows up, and as a result, uh, Israel's Hasbara uh, is very, <coughs> is sort of lost at sea. Uh, if you can't decide what you want, then you can't sell it. If you don't know what your product is, you can't sell it. You can only sell something that you know. If you don't have a strategic goal, and all you're trying to do is survive the next hit from Washington, the next hit from the Israeli media, the next hit from the New York Times, whatever it happens to be, 
then your Hasbara efforts are going to reflect that lack of strategic direction. So I think that, uh, you know, we talk a lot about Hasbara as if it's a standalone issue of what we need is better Hasbara. No, what we need is a goal that makes sense, that we can achieve, that secures our interests and, our, and reflects our values. And uh, so long as we don't have one, our husband is going to suffer. Our ability to make our case to the West, to the Americans, to whomever, is going to be minimized. Because, again, you know, if you don't know what you're selling, you can't sell it. And unfortunately, uh, at least for the past 18 years, Israel hasn't known what it wants to sell. And so we haven't been selling it. On the other hand, the Palestinians know exactly what they want to sell. They know exactly where they want to go. They know what they have to sell in order to get there. And even though they're very unattractive on the surface, I mean, they're, they're terrorists, and they're anti-Semites, and they engage in terrorism, and they indoctrinate hatred in their schools, and they celebrate terrorism, uh, they've been extremely effective, and that uh, is because they know where they want to go. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's just, again, you know, it's so easy to point a finger and say, Yuli Edelstein, you're a failure, but it's not him. It's not him, it's not the foreign ministry, it's not the prime minister's office, uh, bureaucrats or officials who are in charge of selling Israel's message. Israel has no message. So they can't sell it. That one. This guy has hit his hand. That one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Well, that line of message. Um, George is Palestine. That, that's our delivery, really. really. Um, is it more in our interest? to resolve the Palestinian issue via such a solution as Jordan's Palestine in 2018, a relationship with the Hashem idea. Especially given that the next prince is already Palestinian and his mother. Um, you know, I know the argument for saying let's uh, drop the whole thing on Jordan. Um, I think we can solve it ourselves. I don't think that we have to make Jordan Palestine. I think we have to make Judea and Samaria Israel. worried about uh, absorbing the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria and uh, giving them a path towards citizenship under the, uh, under the framework of uh, the application of Israeli law and jurisdiction to Judea and Samaria. Because um, I think that so many of the parameters of our discourse on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are based upon false information, specifically demographic information that claims that they're going to become the, uh, the majority west of the Jordan within, I don't know, five minutes. It's not true. It's not true. If, uh, if we were to annex, or it's not even annex, because under international law, those territories belong to us uh, in accordance with the mandate mandate in Palestine from 1922 that made those territories part of the area that was supposed to see the reconstitution of the Jewish homeland. And uh, those areas are ours under international law. So all we have to do is apply our laws to them. And I think that if we were to do that, we would still see today that uh, if every single one of them, unlike their brethren in Jerusalem who have opted not to be Israeli citizens, if every single one of the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria were to accept Israeli citizenship, which would be offered to them, uh, we would still have a two-thirds Jewish majority in our citizenship. So the whole question of whether we're going to lose our massive Jewish majority uh, would be solved. Uh, the answer would be no. Uh, and we have massive Aliyah potential from abroad. Uh, 
and, and also our birth rates are going up, theirs are going down. When we started this series of lectures about eight years ago, Caroline was our first speaker. You recall it was in a little room downstairs that accommodated about 200 people. We squeezed in 250 and they sat on the floor right by where you're speaking. Today we're well over a thousand people. You've been here very often and you're one of the reasons that this series is so successful. I would remind you when you leave the sanctuary, because that's, I think these programs are important enough that they represent the totality of the Jerusalem Great Synagogue. We always believe, Am Yisrael Chai, no matter what. 